So um, my name is Keith Clement, and I am a professor of criminology at California State University, Fresno. Um, I, I was very pleased to report in the schedule of events they had me from UCLA, the number one hardest campus to get into in the United States. As it turns out, Fresno State is a little easier to get into than both UCLA and, and Berkeley, of course. Um, people often ask, what is a professor of criminology doing discussing otherwise fairly technical issues? And one thing that we understand about technology is that it tends to be an end user problem or a people problem as opposed to, you know, it's not always a technical issue. So I think that one of the biggest issues when talking about cybersecurity and completely transformative um, issues like AI, we need to focus on the people that are involved in all of this. Like we could talk about the role of automation and AI and, and the estimated five to 60% of the workforce that may somehow be affected by um, AI as a new wave of transformative technology that's currently going on. Beyond serving as a professor at a university, I have the honor and privilege of serving as the California Cybersecurity Task Force Workforce Development Education Subcommittee Chair. I have been in that position since about 2013 when Governor Brown, then Governor Brown, set up the California Cybersecurity Task Force with the intention of providing an advisory role to senior California administration leadership, et, et cetera. Um, in the context of that um, cybersecurity task force, we have been developing a career education pipeline and pathway across all levels of education in the areas of cybersecurity. And in 2023, again, 10 years after the um, we began the task force, we now begin to see the rise of data analytics, AI, machine learning, uh, all these other types of areas as well. So we want to make sure while developing this cybersecurity career education pipeline pathway project to prepare the next 75,000 Californians in cybersecurity roles, that we make sure that we focus extensively on additional areas of concern to cybersecurity. And of course, AI is a, a major driver in that area. And I assume that's why we're all here today. Outside of those two roles, I also serve as the California um, Interagency Advisory Committee on Apprenticeship, or IACA. They are run through the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. They are found under the California Division of Industrial Relations. And we have been working on a series of occupational frameworks that would take a employee, a apprentice, all the way from uh, help desk and uh, you know client service relations all the way through a, the existing pathway is through a cybersecurity analyst. And we are in the process of expanding that to cybersecurity um, engineering of which of the 750,000 jobs available in the United States right now in cybersecurity, about 10% of them are cybersecurity engineering positions specifically that are available. I think that's the number one job classification in cybersecurity right now that is the um, most, most coveted, most um, sought after. I have a couple of other additional roles as well. Um, I'm the executive advisory board member for the Cybersecurity Workforce Alliance. They are a group of 4,000 participants and we work on education and training programs in close conjunction with major industry, particularly drawn from banking, finance, healthcare, and some of the other large, large employers. <sighs> what else do I do? I don't get much sleep. I guess that's probably the answer to all that. So today we're here to talk about the role of cybersecurity and and AI, I, I I hope you like the slides that we've we've been showing. Um, you know more of the strong AI stuff. Let's see how much of this I can do to do. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Minority Report, for those that have seen the movie. The, the precogs, there's our friend Hal. I was going to do a Hal impersonation, but uh, um, here's AI crushing the two award-winning, most money-generating contestants in Jeopardy history right there. Uh, and look at that. I don't know if I've ever seen $77,000 on the Jeopardy big board, but, but here we are today. So I will allow this to loop along while I provide some general comments and a couple of these slides I'll probably jump on um, in a little bit more detail. The first issue to talk about is this idea of the problems that are found with anything new. The, the human condition is, is adverse to change and transformative change or all encompassing change is, is, even, is, is even more radical for, for us and, and how we um, perceive of and make decisions. Um, I think that it is critical to note that there is a convergence of, of issues. That is that um, we could talk easily about cybersecurity, the threats and the risks and the, the types of issues that have, um, have arisen as a result of the almost complete day-to-day -day control of computing and social media and devices and all of these kinds of things that we, we all have. We as a, as a society are very plugged in. And I think one of the concerns that we have is that we have not always baked in security solutions to hardware, software, apps, and all these other kinds of things. And in fact, in many cases, it would appear, seems to appear that a lot of security measures that have been taken are after the fact or post hoc decisions. And in the engineering and design phases, it doesn't appear that security was really on their mind. And then they came back and did it after the fact. And, you know, I know that I'm speaking to a room of security professionals or prospective security professionals. And you'd probably wonder what's up with all that. But, you know, they, they didn't ask me on all this kind of stuff. California, the fourth or the fifth largest global economy currently in the world. I think that California and Germany kind of go back and forth. When energy costs go up, we're number four. And when energy costs go down, Germany is the fourth largest. We have over a trillion dollars in California, in GDP, and we are an economic and a technological powerhouse. And as a result of these kinds of issues, California has a vested interest in the protection of our networks, our dedicated servers, all, all, these, all these kinds of things. Um, and so with this economic incentive, the state of California has been very interested in the development of cybersecurity. And there's a bunch of new um, things like CalSecure. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's, it's the plan for cybersecurity in, in California. Um, and with economics and the interconnectedness of the world, given the tech connections that we all have, cybersecurity is itself an issue. We could talk about the workforce problems. We could talk about business loss. We could talk about privacy. You know, we can go all there. And if you had any questions on any of those in a few minutes, I'd be happy to get into those. But the, the issue, we, we're on... Um, we're not on firm ground in general as a society in, in terms of our security posture and, and then along comes AI. And the impact of AI on the security environment is a tremendous one, right? It, it opens the door to new attack vectors. It, it opens the door to new areas of nefarious activity, such as some of this vishing and some of the, these other things that are, that are going on out there that we have to, we have to deal with. 
I think one of the reasons why AI has really made an impact in the security area is that AI has really changed the way that humans interact with computers or computing, and AI has tremendously impacted what we can do and how we can use the increasing data pools that that we are able to to generate. Um, I, I've seen data sets of billions of data points or data artifacts, and those large data sets would otherwise be difficult for a normal pair of eyes or team of eyes to review, analyze, and 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 make big decisions. So it, it it's changed our relationship and it's changed the way that we relate to technology. And, um, you know, we could talk about the values of all of this. We could talk about the economics of all of this. Again, $16 trillion of global value and domestic product. But the McKinsey report, and I'm not sure of those of you that are familiar with the so-called McKinsey report, along with the $16 trillion of new economic development as a result of AI, machine learning, and other types of things, there is a tremendous impact on um, us as people and our relationship with the workplace, right? Because AI drives automation. And depending on who you ask, between 5 to 60% between five and 60% of current occupations are going to be modified, changed, affected, impacted by the role of AI. And, and then it becomes whether you are a cynical or an optimist or, or a realist. When somebody says to me between five and 65%, I usually go into the middle ranges there somewhere. That is that about one in three folks realistically are going to have the fundamental job that they have remarkably changed. We've done some work on intergenerational workforce, um, intergenerational workforce. By 2025, 80% of the workforce is going to be so-called Gen Z or millennial. And, and one of the interesting things about Gen Z when they get to the workplace is they look around and see all these routine mundane activities that could be automated with no problems whatsoever that that actually uh, i mean the problems are on the human side but as far as efficiency performance and all these other measures of of the workplace we may be better off not the people who lose a job, not the people that have their jobs redefined or redescribed, and certainly not the folks that now have to go into upskilling, reskilling, or or any of any of those kinds of issues. So there is an intergenerational component to a comfort level with computing, with security, with AI. It'll be interesting to see how these values play out, play out over time. I want to comment about the nature of transformative change. So we have new generations of, of workforce. We, we have a new generation of job titles like, for example, the term social media is a fairly new term, what, 15 years old or something, that 20 years ago, if you were talking to your parents and they asked you, what did you want to do for a living when you grew up or whatever, and you said, I want to be a social media content designer, your parents were like, or your professors, like, what the hell are you talking about? What is that? Whereas today, most organizations, certainly the ones that are leading the charge, have their own social media department. I was reading the other day about how FEMA deploys huge team, a federal emergency management agency, when responding to disasters or emergencies or Super Bowl issues, wildfires, you know, those types of things, they actually bring a huge cadre of who? Social media folks. They have two roles. 
One is to provide information and data, you know, in an actionable, strategic sense, um, communication that somebody can do something with, right? I mean, you know, not the fire is coming and you're doomed, rather fire is coming, it's going to be here in about 20 minutes, please, here are the three exit routes that you and your family need to be taken. And the second role of this, not just the actionable and strategic communication information, is to prevent misinformation, disinformation, and all that. And that's one of those slides. When it comes up next, we'll jump on it real quick. But it's an example of how the workplace is changing. And one of the things about generative AI is that it could probably generate faster, more effective messages than we, we tend to find. Let's see, is that the one I'm looking for? No. Um, it is a slide that talks about misinformation, disinformation. And, and so that's one of the issues, again, back to this idea of transformative change that we're talking about here is through generative AI. Students can actually compose better essays than, than us as professors and professional writers can actually do for ourselves. To me, that's usually an indicator of, of cheating going on. When I read the essay, I'm like, Huh, that's right, better than I would have written. That's when we begin to start thinking about this. So, so is AI a threat in the classroom then, right? Students take your prompts and they can find out the answer and then compose a better essay than the faculty member. Or can we instead use AI as a teaching moment, right? There we are, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. This is one of the key issues that is relating to the role of AI and the, the negative side. Again, it is important to recognize that we live in a democratic society of which the, the free flow of accurate information is essential for us as a public or as a citizenry to make informed decisions. And one of the negative roles of AI, as it turns out, has been in the opportunity for our political or global adversaries to weaponize information to, to make a society question its values, question its culture, question the way that we have done things. And that's a perfect example of a role potential role of AI. It, it works both ways, right? We can use AI to generate the, the bogus messages, but we also can use AI as a framework by which we can uh, truth test the information that we see that comes across our TV or our computer screens. And I think that's a huge issue right there. Um, AI is important because it is involved with the data and the information that we have that we need to use as the fuel for governance in a free and democratic society. And again, we can look at it of either of two ways. It is either generating the bogus information or it is out there and getting rid of content that is inappropriate, et cetera. I think that AI and cybersecurity both touch on another critical issue these days, so-called zero trust architecture and the idea of trust no device, the, the idea that it is before too long, the algorithms that we are utilizing to, to understand and to best generate quality information through AI also is um, at risk, shall we say, like for example, um, a script kitty or a, a, a junior hacker um, that relies on existing malicious code that they can tweak and turn about. AI apparently is pretty good at coding. <laughs> Who didn't see that coming? And that actually we have been able to see a force multiplier of so-called wannabe hackers, uh, hacktivists, et cetera, where they can actually utilize AI to, to generate this 
this nefarious code and they can elevate themselves rather quickly from a hacker in training to actually a, a pretty um, significant one, um, coding stuff, force multipliers, all of these kinds of things. Uh, yes. Ooh. Got a question. Um, there was a question in the chat. Um, Peter Weber asks, can you give some examples of AI generated misinformation? Huh. Well, I would like to begin AI generated. Examples of? This is a turbulent, multipolar world that we live in today. There are numerous political actors at the state level to the individual level, all who have an incentive to provide this kind of misinformation. Um, there are plenty of examples, particularly around election time and or other large global events. So, for example, Super Bowls and, and other large public gatherings, the negative impact of so-called misinformation or disinformation could be could be a could could yield to horrific outcomes. Like, for example, we all suddenly, our, our phones begin to blow up and we're all getting messages and tweets or whichever your social media platform is. Your, your Instagram account is blowing up about how there is a, uh, an, an active shooter in a stand at a, at a particular uh, sporting event. That would be an example of how misinformation or disinformation could be, could be utilized negatively. I like to think of things in terms of international affairs, and I, I I like to look at the paper every morning to see exactly what new bad news is going on out there. And you know, it the negative effect here is that people begin to distrust the sources of information that they receive, and and that you begin to cross check this information that you are receiving. And in some cases, it, it can be found to be bogus. I think one of the issues with AI and how this really makes things a little bit more mm, dangerous, shall we say, is the ability of AI to golly mimic the human voice as well as videos, right? I mean, we, we take images or we take voice data and we are able to make changes, maybe subtle changes, maybe huge changes, and, and that it really negatively impacts the way that we interact. For example, if you got a email from some Nigerian prince that you just won $20 billion or something crazy like that, and, and please um, give us your bank information and your PIN number, well, we would recognize that as... as fake i i hope so <laughs> and nowadays what happens when you get a voicemail from your doctor significant other ch children in a voice that you would completely recognize in a a a fearful tone that you would pick out talking or conversing in the way that you would anticipate them to be speaking of and who knows what the message would actually be, right? I think that there's some, um, I think that um, Russian President Vladimir Putin has also recently been the victim of some of this misinformation and disinformation campaigns. Um, I know that American sources have exhibited the same thing. Um, I, I know that through significant forensic and digital analysis, we might be able to to tell whether something was fake or not fake, or whether something was legit or not legit, 
but by that time the damage could have easily been done and it could take some time to perform the forensics to get that information out and available uh, yay another question hi another another one from the chat um with the rise of ai what are some universal cybersecurity measures that are going to be implemented that's from rachel hong Wow. You know, I, that's a stumper, right? Let's, I mean, cutting to the chase, uh, we were just getting on top of understanding the nature of the security and information security problem by itself. And then as AI continues to show its capabilities and what it is able to do, I, I do not know what the next steps are. I, I think that the easy answer here is that we need more policy guidance on how we can utilize AI in the pursuit of better governance and information. But the the future here is uncertain, okay? I, I think that how AI, AI on the one hand can assist nefarious actors in launching effective attacks, and at the same time, AI can be used to defeat or uh, mitigate attacks I am not sure which side of the equation is winning right now. I'll I'll be I'll be be honest. There is a little Hoover report on AI that came out in 2022, I believe. Um, the California Little Hoover Commission, as you may recall, is a group that provides advice and guidance on significant problems and issues uh, to to government. And the report there was um, very unclear on the future direction of AI and security, other than to state, as many reports often do, we need to do more work in this area. And, and, and I think that that was a fantastic question. I, I hope that my, my response addressed the part of it that I, that I could. Um, I just I am. I, I don't know if I am an optimist or a cynic in these questions. What I what I do know is that in the global world future, those that control AI have an absolute leg up in and and their hegemony and and their control. And I, I certainly hope that we get these issues figured out sooner rather than later. I don't know if there are other questions on the chat, but is there anybody in the room that has any has any questions? I'm going to take a, a a sip of my water if uh, if somebody has a question. I believe that you can go to the microphone so that we can make sure that we get it out and about. There is one more on the chat. Yay. Um, is AI capable of detecting and defending AI generated attack patterns at scale and speed? This is from Ramalingam Mohan. Yes, with the caveat that the speed is the issue, that this, the speed is the variable. That is that I've seen AI detecting um, deep fakes or other other nefarious activity in a matter of milliseconds and also over a course of a couple of days. So, you know, again, back to the example of actionable intelligence and we're, we're all at a Super Bowl or some other event and, and, and we're getting this um, uncollaborate, uncorroborated uh, uh, information. There's some kind of bad thing going on. We just hope that they can get that message detected quickly and a couple of days of lag time isn't going to be very helpful to anybody. So, so to me, it's a matter of speed and the, the better, um, better AI solutions would definitely increase the amount of time it would take for us to be able to respond to AI generated nefarious activities 
Um, as far as scale is concerned, you know, I, I do believe that we are now beginning our organizations and our, our companies and our government um, industry is definitely spending a lot more time on policies, processes, and governance that may improve our ability to respond um, in, in, in a timely fashion, right? That, that is the uh, gist of what I'm trying to say. AI is effective at determining AI malicious activities. I just don't know how quickly the turnaround time is. And in a modern economy, a, a period of a couple of 24 hours, you know, could be the end of your corporation or, you know, put you on very, very bad footing. Um, I think that we would want to distinguish AI's role in national security and economic security. We could also view it as a individual and a resiliency problem, a community problem. Um, and a lot of this really relies on this term, um, the weaponization of information. Information has been weaponized. AI can serve a productive role in countering those, but again, through generative AI could also be a major contributor of the actual information in its, um, I, I think that, uh, have any of you seen The Social Dilemma on Netflix? Um, how about um, Made in Beijing? Um, um, that's a YouTube video that you would have access to, Made in Beijing. Um, and I, I know a variety of folks out there that think that we are in a information war with China specifically and that the role of AI in that potential conflict is, is very huge. Um, anybody seen BitLocker? It's a 2018 film that may be of interest to this. I assume many of you have probably seen some of this kind of stuff. Um, I think that one of the big things that I want to pull out of some of these slides is general themes. You've been watching these slides all along. Um, I think that there's really three sets of things that I would like to talk about. Um, the first, and, and maybe it relates to some of the questions that we've gotten through, through the chat. A typical breach, data breach, um, costs the organization about uh, $9.4 million an incident, okay? Um, and what we find is that with AI, <clears throat> AI improved security measures, the cost of the breach goes down to $6 million. And what the, the difference in that cost, that three or so million dollars, is typically found through the detection of the breach in the first place. So, so that's where a lot of the economic savings is coming from, as well as theoretically speaking, at least, the idea that AI can take overworked, under-resourced security teams and routinize a variety of the log and other forms of analysis that goes on there. It, it, it takes the human eyes away from, you know, report after report of things that would otherwise have to be viewed, cross-indexed, and, and referenced. So um, $9.4 million, there, there's a slide right there. Mitigating factors, AI platform, encryption, analytics, amplification, compliance, complexity, and migration. And I do believe that, um, I saw the other day that about 50% of breaches um, are coming out of the cloud or affecting the cloud. So maybe, maybe the additional utilization of AI for cloud-based security and cloud-based systems may be an example of a, uh, opportunity to move forward. Ooh, yay. Another from chat. <clears throat> this is from Patrick Rochira. One of the areas in AI misinformation um, is when AI created a writer and attributed an answer to this fictitious writer. 
how do we guard against going down a rabbit hole from an AI generated answer? Well, you know, there is a lot that there's, I think, a several different issues that could be unpacked in that fantastic, um, that fantastic question. I think that um, generative AI has a variety of contributions to be made. I think that a lot of folks are fairly impressed. But for example, there are some glaring figures that um, there are some glaring issues that come out of the AI um, world in this respect. And th th I think that it's a rabbit hole, however we look at it, um, but that disinformation is, um, is generated for human purposes, utilized through the technology of AI. I think that one of the concerns that we have is that there are very few soft or safeguards in, in place in IT policies, procedures. I think that, that we are down the rabbit hole. I think that the, the optimist would say that we just got down in there. And I think that the, the cynic or the realist would say that we're actually pretty far down this rabbit hole. And um, how do we extricate ourselves from these issues is of deep concern. I, I think that the policy making and the, the governance approach of this is only half of the question. We need to find better ways to use technology to fight fire with fires, they would say, develop more heuristic frameworks by which we can analyze these issues. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the benefit of time. These things move on and continue at a pace well outside of our ability to, to restrain or pull it back. So I hope that answered the question at hand. Um, another from chat. Um, I'm going to paraphrase this a little. Um, is there a compelling business case for UC cyber systems to upgrade or adopt AI powered solutions to defend UC systems from adversaries who are already using AI? Yes. I think so. I think that the I think that enterprise has that is an advantage of the enterprise based system is that solutions are developed for pressing issues at need. And when these pressing issues can threaten your business model or your governance model, we can prioritize those values and significantly upgrade our capabilities. And I absolutely do believe that a the embrace of AI on the behalf of government and organizations and, and individuals in a variety of cases is the way forward in all of this. And um, I, I am a big fan of workforce development and education and training. And I think that this is really points to one of the shortcomings that we have here right now is what is our ability to develop a better, more efficient workforce using AI um, using AI principles, what can we automate from a organizational perspective that makes sense, not just in terms of the bottom line, but also in terms of making for a more robust response to the possibility of misinformation, disinformation, or, or other hazards that we have out there in the system. So absolutely, I would embrace that. I, I do have two minutes left, so... Um, I don't know if there's anything else in the chat. Um, if, if there's nothing else in the chat, I certainly don't have anything else to add. Um, let's see, authoritarian society. Uh, I, I did have one last comment. Um, in a polarized world, democratic societies require free circulation of information for public discourse and consensus decision making. We need to get it right. On the other hand, authoritarian societies can use information, disinformation, misinformation for nationalistic support or false information for public support. And I think that they call that propaganda. So 
that's all I have. I will certainly hang around for a little while, although I do imagine that I'm probably the person standing between you and lunch, and I don't miss many lunches myself, so I, I don't know what they have for us over there today, but I'll hang around in this general area if you have any questions or um, you are interested in AI workforce development on in conjunction with the California Cybersecurity Task Force Workforce Development Education Subcommittee. Um, cybersecurity and IAI are both of our concern and happy to chat with those that are of interest. And other than that, have a great day. And I might see some of you later this afternoon, um, probably right here if they moved all the Wheeler 400s down to here. We'll all be talking about cybersecurity, workforce development, and, and apprenticeships and how they can assist us. So have a great day. Great afternoon. Thank you very much. Take care.